what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed unless of course it's your taste level that's lacking okay because it ain't me um my daughter bella is in the corner over there chewing her feet down to the bone so if you hear it it'll be over soon i'm so sorry about it y'all i'm so excited today because plant con is coming up i know if you follow me on instagram you probably tired of hearing me talk about plant con baby i am so excited i I just can't wait. If you will also be there and you see me, please say hi. Don't be scared. Do not be afraid. I was gonna go just Saturday. I don't know. Because one of my friends is going both days. And I kind of want to go back with her on Sunday. So I might be there both days. Just depends. But anyway, that is not what this video is about. I hope you guys are well. And love to everybody who came and spent time with me on my live stream. We had fun. I didn't get no work done none however comma um it was a good time i enjoyed y'all and during the live stream we discussed like having an after discussion like a live after discussion for the cases that i have covered that week and so we're gonna do that i don't know if i'm gonna do it friday or saturday because i kind of want to do it saturday and show y'all what i got from plant con so i don't know but i will definitely keep y'all posted bella girl i thought you'd be done by now you didn't make me lie to the people Y'all, this morning, just, just a few seconds ago, I probably shouldn't tell this story. Well, I'm gonna look like a horrible person. Let me tell you, so just keep my intentions in the forefront of your mind. So I'm downstairs in my home minding my business, like I always do when I ain't minding nobody else's. And I see something wiggling on the ground, girl. It's a snake a baby snake but a snake nonetheless a brown snake and i'm like i don't recall whether or not brown snakes are harmless or not i don't know but just in case you wanted to try to bite me i got me a nice little target bag doubled it up grabbed a hold of that girl and my plan was to toss her over the back fence um but mm, the back fence was way too high like it's extremely high and so i ended up just tossing the whole bag because mama panicked sorry um people that live back there it wasn't nobody's direct yard with somebody they so anyway um sorry about that yeah and the crazy thing is had this been a cockroach oh baby i probably would have immediately started crying there's no way i would have been able to conquer a roach okay i can't do it and i feel like that's absolutely crazy to not have been afraid of a snake but be terrified crippled by a cockroach but that's my truth and that's what happened today and i want my street credits for wrangling a snake Period. I had to save my children. I'm a mother. I couldn't allow them to get struck. Now, if it was a cockroach, though, baby, every man for themselves. Y'all better run, because I'm running and hollering, too. You guys, today we are getting into the story of Ricky Casso, a.k.a. the Acid King. Have you heard of him? Richard Allen Casso Jr. is born March 29th of 1967, and him being an Aries makes a lot of sense, actually. He is born to two school teachers in Huntington, New York. In total, there are four children. There are three girls, one boy, with Ricky being the oldest child. And because Ricky's father has come from a long lineage of athletes, with Ricky Sr.'s father being minor league baseball player Alfred Casso, Richard Sr., a.k.a. Dick, appropriately um, referred to as such, has an intense desire for all four of his children to achieve some level of athletic success, particularly his only son. Now, in addition to teaching, Dick also coaches baseball and he coaches wrestling at the school. His daughters participate in sports and they do well. And little Ricky as well, but he's taken a liking to football instead of baseball. And he really enjoys the sport. He gets up at 6 a.m. every morning to go play football with the local children on Seaview Avenue. And he is very good at it. Football, baseball, tomato, tomato. Dick is satisfied with his son becoming a football star instead of baseball. Ball. But this is not Ricky's only talent. He is also very talented musically. He is very funny, very witty. He has a great personality, which garners him a lot of attention, a lot of popularity. And of course, with that comes a lot of friends friends who all noticed that at around age 12 Ricky's personality takes a drastic change and all of a sudden he has no interest in not only school but sports either and when he tells his father that he no longer wants to play football well that is not acceptable for little dick 
who makes it abundantly clear to his son that if he is not going to become the athletic star that he had hoped him to be, that he had invested in him becoming, then he essentially has no use for him. Now, at first, he tries to force Ricky to play football. And one morning, when Ricky is late to practice, Dick punishes him by beating him across the back with the wooden handle of a broom. Unfortunately, this is not the start of the abuse that Ricky has endured at the hands of his father. For the bulk of his childhood, Dick has been brutally violent, emotionally abusive, verbally as well, and is super demeaning. And people would often witness Dick abuse Ricky outside. There was an instance where Ricky wanted to grow his hair out and his father wanted him to cut it, y'all. And when he refused to cut it, Dick decided he was going to take matters into his own hands. He grabbed some scissors to cut Ricky's hair himself and he is seen by the neighbors chasing his son out of the house with this pair of scissors and him not being able to catch his son really pissed him off he decided to cancel his little on foot pursuit go back into the house take all of his favorite little clothing items and cut them up in the front yard there is also another instance a neighbor spoke about where they witnessed Dick being physically abusive with Ricky in the woods behind their house but they didn't intervene because the prevailing attitude of everyone is if it's not your kid it's not your business and another reason that dick is never challenged on his treatment of his child is because he was seen as a very upstanding citizen people really looked up to him he was a pillar of the community being a teacher and a coach so no one openly discusses this other side of dick they just turn a blind eye to it and let him handle his kids how he sees fit. And his treatment of Ricky only worsens when Ricky quits sports and shatters his dream of living vicariously through his son. Now, as I mentioned before, with his disinterest in sports also came his disinterest in school and essentially all of the other things that he was interested in. He develops a new interest marijuana. When his father finds out about this, he attempts to have the boy institutionalized at Long Island Jewish Hospital. When he was evaluated, he was diagnosed with what at the time was referred to as manic depression, but is now bipolar disorder. And the psychiatrist that sees him determines that his mental health does not warrant institutionalization. So they release him back into the care of his parents. However, this was the final straw on top of Ricky not wanting to play football anymore. Dick kicks his now 13-year-old son out of the house. And at that age, you really don't have a lot of resources and knowledge about how to fend for yourself unless you have been put in an unfortunate situation where you have had to learn those things at an earlier age. But this was not the case for Ricky. He does not know the first thing about taking care of himself. He sleeps in unlocked cars that he'd find throughout the neighborhood. There are nights that he spends on the floor of public bathrooms. At one point, a friend of his was allowing him to sleep in their shed in their backyard. He sleeps at Scudder Beach sometimes. But most nights, he spends sleeping in the woods where he would also hang out during the day at times. And another place he would like to hang out at and sometimes sleep in is cemeteries. To eat, he steals food from local stores. And as it becomes increasingly difficult to figure out his situation, be it where to sleep, how to feed himself, he takes to selling drugs to one, have access to them and to also have a little cash to feed himself. It is mostly hallucinogens, which he also begins using. And by the time he is 16, he is the chief supplier of hallucinogens in the area, okay? He is the guy, thus earning himself the nickname, the Acid King. Everyone in the North Port and surrounding areas know him to be the guy to go to to get their hands on these type of drugs. Now, another something that sparks his interest around this age is Satanism and the subject of the occult. Okay, he comes across a couple books on the topic and he spends a lot of time reading them. He begins carrying around the satanic Bible, randomly blurting out Hail Satan. And although he is now dropped out of high school and has become a drifter, he is kept in contact with most of his childhood friends, one of whom being a young man by the name of Gary Lauer, another local teen with a little nasty little drug habit who was also dropped out of high school and 
Jasmine has a very troubled relationship with their family as well. Now, Gary is not living with his family either, be it on his own circumstances or circumstances similar to Ricky's. I'm not sure. Many of Ricky's friends are huge heavy metal fans and love the dark gothic aesthetic. Now, none of them are Satan worshipers, but they often play into the misunderstanding that one equates to the other and sometimes they would even joke like they were mostly to piss off or annoy their fundamentalist parents however Ricky's joking wasn't quite joking he would get high on his own little supply and take his group of friends down to the cemetery so that he could try and commune with Satan. Now, he never participates in any actual rituals or anything major. He would just sit there and chant Satan's name. But more troubling than his obsession with Satanism is the very obvious deterioration of his mental health. He jokes often about ending himself, referring to death as the ultimate trip. And this kind of worries some of his friends. They find it a little bit alarming. Over time, his persona, how people perceive him, goes from this bright, witty, funny, talented kid to a weirdo that most of them only hang out with to buy drugs or do them for free. And most of the kids believe that he only acts more unhinged than he actually is. No one actually feels threatened by him. Now his friend Gary, who was a lot like him, is one of the few friends that he has that still genuinely likes him and sees him as a friend, not just some weirdo with the benefits. And there are two other guys that hang out with them that are genuine friends of his. Jimmy Toriano and Albert Quinones. They're so loyal to Ricky that when he says that he wants to get his hands on an actual human skull, the three of them go down to a local old cemetery with him to help him dig for one, which results in Ricky being arrested for grave robbing. Now, during the colder months, living outside damn near took Ricky out of here, okay? He contracts pneumonia and ends up in the hospital. While there, his mother visits him and she attempts to have him admitted to a psychiatric facility. During his eval, he lies, okay? He denies having any thoughts or talks about self-deletion. He denies being fond of Satan and all of the things, child. He said he don't know what that lady is talking about. The counselor that sees him finds him to not be at risk of harming himself or anyone else and he is therefore free to return to the woods when his health is in order. And so that is a exactly what he does. Now a short time after this, Ricky is at a party having a good old time and he actually passes out from being so high. While he is passed out, Gary goes into his pocket and slides out 10 bags of angel dust that Ricky had intended to sell. When he wakes up and realizes that he has been robbed, he is furious. Gary immediately admits to being the culprit but he is only able to return what is left of it while ricky was there passed out he had used and shared five of the 10 bags that he stole he promises ricky that he'll pay him back it comes out to be 50 dollars worth of product which he does not have because job if he had the money he would have just purchased it and not stole it to begin with so the two young men agree on a payment plan and this really changes the dynamic of their friendship they continue to hang out but ricky Ricky stays mad at Gary and he expresses that anger often. His treatment of Gary very closely mimics the treatment that he received from Dick. Ricky takes every chance he gets to embarrass and berate Gary. On several occasions, he physically assaults him and Gary pretty much just takes it all on the chin. It takes a little while, but eventually he does pay Ricky back the $50. And by mid-June of 1984, things appear to be good between the friends. But on June 19th, everyone would come to find out that looks can be very deceiving. Ricky, Jimmy, Albert, and Gary all make plans to hang out at Ricky's, aka the Woods Child, to hang out and get high. Now, oddly, Gary is not really wanting to go. Ricky practically begs him to come along. He entices him with not only drugs, but donuts assuring him that it is gonna be a good time. A few other teens join the foursome in the woods. They're hanging out. They make a nice little bonfire. Is that the vibe? They overindulge in LSD and PCP. And as the day turns into night, the other teens that had joined the original four, they fade out, go home, leaving Ricky, Gary, Albert, and Jimmy there alone. Now, what transpires next when it's just the four of them depends on who you believe. We for sure know that at some point, Ricky begins 
Simmons being nasty to Gary again and things escalate to Ricky and Jimmy beating and kicking Gary. Then Ricky takes out a pocket knife and begins to stab Gary. Now, according to Albert, Jimmy holds Gary down while Ricky is attacking him. But according to Jimmy, he did not hold Gary down at all, but he did help Ricky to drag Gary's body deeper into the woods and cover him up with twigs and leaves after the fact. Now, while they're doing this, Ricky suddenly sits up and this startles them because they thought he was deceased. At this point, Ricky freaks out, continues his attack, this time aiming directly at his face and eyes until he was absolutely sure that Gary was gone. Afterward, he goes and tosses the weapon into a nearby body of water and the three of them make a pact to never speak about this to anyone. And out of all three of them, Ricky is the one that can now hold up his end of the bargain by keeping quiet. He brags to several friends about what he had done, laughing about it like it was funny, showing no type of remorse. And when they don't believe him, he offers to prove himself by taking them to the woods for a viewing of Gary's remains. Unfortunately, like I previously mentioned, Gary was also estranged from his family. He was living on the streets. So no missing persons report is filed because they don't even realize that he's missing. There's no one else to alert the police that something could potentially be wrong. Except, of course, the 20-something teens that Ricky takes by to see Gary's remains. Not one of them go to police or even mention it to a parent. And one of the young ladies actually advises Ricky to do a better job covering Gary up so that he is not easily spotted. Now, after a little time goes by, Gary's parents do begin to inquire about his whereabouts, but everyone that they ask, including Ricky, claim that they have not seen him and they don't know where he could be. And Ricky comes to realize that that tip the girl had given him about covering Gary up more was probably in his best interest when the odor of the remains becomes so pungent that it's now transcending the wooded area. At this point, he and Jimmy decide that it is best to just go ahead and bury him. So they dig a very shallow hole in the ground right next to where he currently is and then just push him over into it. As they are pushing him, because of the state of the comp that the remains are currently in, the head detaches from the rest of the body and Ricky is very amused by this. He laughs at it and pushes it. They cover him up. They cover the freshly dug earth with more leaves and twigs. And at this point, they're very confident that they have gotten away with this and they figure now it's time to move on so they sit and chat for a bit and make plans to hitchhike their way to california they figure they go there sell some drugs and start new lives now just one day after the two of them set off on their new life journey someone who had heard through the grapevine this gruesome story and how ricky was taking people out there to view gary goes to police horrified at the fact that so many people had seen him and no one has said anything. They make an anonymous call and initially police just brush it off. They don't believe it. It's not taken seriously. But once people start to complain about the odor that is coming from the woods, they decide to follow up on their tip. With cadaver dogs, they are easily able to locate this not so deep grave. An autopsy is performed to determine the manner in which Gary had passed. He is identified and his parents are then given the tragic news. And the date they found him was July 4th which was roughly two weeks after he had been left there. Meanwhile, Ricky and Jimmy have made it as far as Chicago before deciding that they no longer want to go all the way to California. They started missing their routine, their old friends, life as they had known it. And suddenly a whole new life in California was not as appealing as it was before. They had decided to sell all of the drugs they had on them and purchase the cash car. But instead of taking it to California, they just go back home unaware that things Things are unraveling. Once they return to Northport, they are really tired. So they pull the car over in front of a yacht club and decide to take a nap. And while they are passed out, someone calls the police to alert this suspicious beat up little car parked outside this nice little yacht club. The responding officer immediately recognizes the two of them and calls for backup without disturbing their sleep. 
The two teens wake up to 18 officers surrounding their vehicles with their weapons drawn. Now, Jimmy gets out of the car and he peacefully surrenders to the officers saying, quote, I always do square business with the cops. And Ricky, on the other hand, decided he wasn't going down without a fight. He resists arrest. He tries attacking the officer with a switchblade that he had hidden in his back pocket. He was unsuccessful in doing so and very quickly subdued. Once the two of them are detained, Albert is also arrested and he very quickly makes a deal. Immunity in exchange for his testimony. And based off of the testimony that he gives the police, Ricky and Jimmy are both charged with second degree murder. At first, Ricky denies having anything to do with anything. But when they hit him with some facts that they could only know if somebody told, he decides to go ahead and confess. And he never gives a a reason for why he had attacked Gary. Now, according to Albert's testimony, Ricky had yelled at Gary, say you love Satan during the attack. And instead, Gary said, I love you, mom. And those were his final words which was really sad considering the fact that he was estranged from her at the time. I'm pretty sure that was difficult for her to hear. Once the media gets wind of this, they do what the media tends to do a lot of the time. They sensationalize the story, saying it was a ritual, that Gary was sacrificed, and all of these things which were not true. They accused Ricky of being a part of some satanic cult fueled by heavy metal music. It was a complete media circus. He didn't have no membership to nobody's cult okay two days after their arrest on july 7th of 1984 17 year old ricky Casso hangs himself in his suffolk county holding cell leaving jimmy to now face trial alone his trial begins and the prosecutors have no physical evidence just the testimony of albert quinones and jimmy's own story changes every time you ask him what happened child and when asked why he explains to his lawyer that that it is very hard to remember exactly what happened with how high he was. Like he can't tell you what was real and what was imagined, what he had hallucinated and really saw. And his lawyer decides to use this in his defense. He and Albert both admit to overindulging in all kinds of drugs that day. So if Jimmy can't really remember exactly what happened or separate reality from fiction, Who's to say that Albert is accurately remembering exactly what happened? At this point, it's Albert's word against Jimmy's and a whole lot of drugs in between. His lawyer begs the question, can either of their testimony be believed when they both were gone off of hallucinogens? And Jimmy is also only being accused of holding Gary down, which he vehemently denies doing. And without any concrete evidence, Jimmy Troiano is found not guilty of what he is charged for, which is murdering Gary Lauer. So after his trial, he gets to go home, but he spends a good portion of his life after the fact in and out of jail for mostly burglary, armed robbery charges. Albert, after the trial, had moved to Manhattan to start his life over and declined all requests for an interview regarding his role in the incident. Now, Ricky's mom was extremely upset with the police. She felt like because at the time that her son was arrested, he was high as a kite baby and he should not have been left unsupervised in his cell. So she publicly bashed the police department for allowing this to happen to her son and his remains were cremated but they were left unclaimed for nearly a year before she went around there and picked him up talk about keeping the same energy everybody's family remains in the neighborhood after all of this happened despite public opinion but when dick castle dies from lyme disease roughly seven years later the remainder of the castle family decides to leave northport for good and they relocate to some unknown area and that pretty much concludes today's case please let me know what your thoughts are down below child it was a mess okay like the video before you leave subscribe if you have not as always i appreciate you so much for spending your time with me and i look forward to seeing you in the next one peace i'd rather take my whiskey deep, my coffee black and anybody know who's here tell him i love him real bad and i want to give him a baby but he wants to take care of the baby girl that's just to show how much i love him i'd rather take my whiskey deep.
How we get from work song to you too sweet? Men don't know what they want because at first it was, oh, my baby's so sweet. Now nah, she too sweet. That's how they do. No, that ain't how they do me, baby. She is tearing these toes up, baby. Her eyes are closed and everything. Like, girl, I know they taste like the gram. Now, in addition, in addition, Dick coaches wrestling and he also is the football coach. He coaches baseball, bro. What am I talking about? Violently brutal. Okay. I guess that worked, but I meant to say brutally violent. He comes across. Come on, Nat, get out of here. Go on, girl. Is the very obvious deteriorate deterioration, girl. Now, according to Albert, Jimmy holds Ricky, not Ricky, grew up. Everybody's family remained in the North. Is it North Point? Where they live at? I forget. 